Hi everyone, today we're starting uh, a topic uh, on ideal gases. This is chapter 15 uh, from module 5 of OCR. Uh, we'll be having a look uh, first, so I'll start with what we're going to be doing first, uh, at the amount of a substance in moles and how to uh, basically use Avogadro's constant and so on. The model theory or uh, kinetic theory of um, gases, uh, in more particular ideal gases and the assumptions that we make. And then how pressure can be expressed in terms of this model. Um, and this will need you to be able to use uh, theories, uh, Newton's theories uh, as well, to be able to explain it mathematically. So we'll start with these things first. Okay, so this is something that you've done in chemistry um, in your GCSEs. However, we do need to use it in physics to be able to explain um, things like... Uh, what happens to gases, ideal gases, uh, which I'll get into in a bit. Um, so we need to be able to explain what happens in gases, like in terms of pressure, temperature, uh, and so on. So like macroscopic properties of gases, uh, we need to be able to describe them in terms of their microscopic properties, such as what happens within the substance. Uh, so how many at uh, atoms are there and so on. Um, you have learned in year 12 that one of the SI units, or one of the base units that you do need to know, is uh, the mole. This is a standard unit, a basic unit, a base unit. Um, and um, it basically stands for how many uh, atoms or molecules are in a given volume of gas. So in other words, um, any particle. It could be particles can be broken down into three different types, atoms molecules or even ions. Ions are just charged atoms. You do need to know a very specific definition of the mole if you're asked to define the mole. Um, we usually say it's just the amount of a substance but that's not enough for your uh, definition for your A-levels. Um, you have to state that uh, one mole is the amount of a substance that contains as many elementary entities, meaning particles, uh, as there are atoms in 0 0.012 kilograms of carbon-12, or uh, you could say 12 grams of carbon-12. Another easier definition, uh, which I, I prefer, is that one mole is the amount of a substance that contains as many particles as exactly 12 grams of carbon-12. Um, so basically, what we're saying is that one mole of any substance contains so many individual atoms or molecules. So 6.02 times 10 to the 23, and that's known as the Avogadro constant, um, Na. It's the same thing as saying, what's a dozen eggs, right? Dozen eggs is 12 eggs, correct? So what's one mole? One mole is 6.02 times 10 to the 23 uh, particles. That can be atoms, it can be molecules, it can be ions. Um, just a quick reminder, atoms are individual. So you have your nucleus with the electrons around it, spinning. But then when you talk about molecules, you could mean that, uh, for example, carbon dioxide. CO2, H2O. These are molecules that contain more than one atom. Okay, so molecules um, contain more than one atom. Could even be the same thing. So like oxygen that we breathe in is O2. Uh, nitrogen in the atmosphere is N2. Um, CO2, like we said already, is a molecule. H2O, water is a molecule. So most of the molecules in the air are diatomic, so there's uh, two atoms stuck together, and then we also have um, uh, the ideal gases, uh, sorry, uh, the noble gases in the periodic table in uh, group zero or group eight. Uh, that's the ones that can exist on their own as individual atoms. So most gases are going to be uh, molecules unless they're noble gases which uh, exist on their own. So, 
like we said, one mole is just the amount of a substance that will contain the same amount of particles as you would find in 12 grams of carbon-12, basically. And one mole of any substance contains exactly 6.02 times 10 to 23 individual atoms or molecules. You do need to memorize the way of calculating it. So uh, N, capital N is equal to lowercase n times Na. Now, capital N stands for the total number of atoms in a substance. N stands for the number of moles in a substance. And Na is uh, the Avogadro constant. So it's a fixed number. And this will be given to you in the um, formula booklet. Uh, which is 6.0 times 10 to the 23. There is no unit because we are actually calculating just atoms or molecules. So in reality, you don't have any unit at all. Um, I put this sign here, carbon uh, sign, symbol. Um, usually you'll find them in the periodic table. Uh, in the exams, they will give you any values that you need. You don't have to memorize any um, masses, atomic masses or anything. Uh, but the important part I'll talk about in a second is what this big number means for us uh, in terms of our calculations. I'm just going to do a quick example. Um, so let's go with, um, for example, if I said I have one mole of, or, or three moles actually, sorry, I have three moles of copper. Now, how many uh, was the number of atoms in three moles of copper? So how many atoms in, are in three moles of copper? We know that n is equal to three, the lowercase n, uh, because that's the number of moles. And we also know Avogadro's constant. So we know that n is equal to n and a, uh, so it's three times that much. It's um, it's like a ratio equation. So you what you have is like I said, a dozen eggs is uh, twelve eggs. So if I had ten dozen eggs, then I'll have one hundred and twenty eggs. It's it's quite a simple calculation. It's just about absorbing how much uh, a mole is. Equally, I could have said how much is in half a mole of copper. So I'll just do half times the Avogadro's constant. Now we also have something called the molar mass. Um, you must have seen this in your chemistry again, in your GCSEs. Uh, but the molar mass is simply the atomic uh, mass of uh, any um, element in the periodic table. But we instead express it in grams per mole. So, for example, we have uh, here Ag 107.9 and 47. This usually stands for the number of at, um, protons, sorry. And this stands for the number of protons and neutrons. But in our case, uh, and in every single case, actually, but uh, what we are interested in using it for calculations, we will be seeing this number as the molar mass. So that means that in one mole, one mole of Ag is uh, one mole of Ag, which has 6.02 times 10 to the 23 uh, atoms. We have, it weighs, sorry, its mass is 107.9 grams. That's why we say that's the grams per mole, so the mass per mole. Um, so there's another equation that you will need to know. It's not given to you, so you will need to uh, remember it. It's like the same thing, though. It's like a ratio um, where the little m, the lowercase m, stands for the mass of a sample of a substance, and n stands for uh, the number of moles. m is the molar mass, capital M is the molar mass. Uh, so molar mass is just the mass number from the periodic table. Um, helium, so you all know helium, is the easiest one to remember. Helium is HE42, right? 
So this is basically the molar mass. Is if I had a uh, one mole of helium, we'll have a mass of four grams, or zero point zero zero four kilograms. The same thing. Remember how to convert it. So that's why we say um, it has a molar mass of four grams per mole. That's what this means. Uh, uranium is the same thing. So uranium is uh, got a, a molar mass of 238, which means that uranium, one mole of uranium weighs 200, has a mass of 238 sorry, grams or 0 0.238 kilograms. Um, when, when it comes to molecules though, we will have individual mass numbers for them, so the uh, the molar mass. And uh, let's say CO2, let's do an example with CO2 actually. So let's say I had CO2. What's the molar mass of CO2? So what would be the mass of one mole of CO2? Um, so I know that carbon is uh, 12.6 and oxygen is uh, 16.8. Uh, so we only have one carbon atom, so its mass is 12 in this molecule, plus we have two uh, oxygen atoms, so it's 2 times 16. So then that leaves us with 12 plus 32. We have 54 grams per mole uh, of uh, CO2. I hope that makes sense. If you have any questions, we can do more in class. Sorry, that was 44. Um, the two equations will need to be linked together at uh, when it comes to some calculations. You could use the equations or you could use uh, logic with um, you know, ratios, but it's better to always keep it uh, neat and mathematical. Uh, so you, we said already that we have uh, N is equal to N times NA. And we also have uh, M is equal to N times M. So to combine these two equations, they only have one common uh, you know, quantity uh, between themselves. So you will need to rearrange for N and just simply place it within the equation here or the other way around. Um, it will be N is equal to M over N and place it there. It just depends what we're calculating. I'll do an example near the end. So um, what we're going to have a look at is the kinetic theory of matter for um, ideal gases. Now this is a model that simply describes the behavior of atoms or molecules in an ideal gas. Uh, an ideal gas is not a real gas. It's uh, something that we simplify uh, in order to make, um, and we make a few assumptions in order to make the calculations uh, simple and um, to avoid the complexity of um, real gases. Uh, it does work really well, though, the, the model, the calculations and everything based on ideal gases work real, very well for real gases too. Um, the only, um, and they actually work better when um, you have, well, the gases are above their boiling point, or the substances are above their boiling uh, point, significantly above that. But they also work well when uh, we have gases at low pressure. Um, so uh, if we have real gases at low pressure or when the temperature of them are, is way above uh, this boiling point, um, then they, the kinetic theory, the model, works quite well. Um, and I'll go on and to compare them as well now. So what are the assumptions? We have about uh, five assumptions are very, very important. You should uh, learn them. Uh, one of the assumptions is that uh, the gas contains a very large number of atoms and molecules uh, moving in random directions and at random speeds. We all know that gases uh, actually do do that. Um, if you had the bo a container and you had gas inside of it, and these are the gas particles, or atoms or molecules, they will all be moving in random directions at different time. So they wouldn't all be moving in this direction. Uh, they will be moving in every different direction. It doesn't matter where, but th uh, that's a very important part of uh, uh, the assumptions that we're making. Um, but it's true as well for real gases. 
And they also have random speeds, so they have random kinetic energy. Some are moving faster than others. Uh, it's important to make it clear. Um, we also know that atoms, uh, well, another assumption is that the atoms are molecules of a gas. They occupy negligible volume uh, compared with the volume of the gas, meaning that uh, each particle doesn't occupy much of the volume that the whole gas can uh, occupy. So we are assuming that um, all of the little gas particles just occupy a very tiny amount um, that is nothing compared to the volume that the gas can uh, spread through. In real gases, this is not true. Um, it does uh, take up some space, um, which means that, uh, it, especially if you start compressing the gas, um, then there will be no volume available for them to move. So the third assumption is that uh, the collisions of atoms or molecules with each other in the container worlds are perfectly elastic and hence uh, no kinetic energy is lost. So uh, collisions, perfectly elastic with no kinetic energy lost. Um, we'll get to that in a second because that plays an important part in terms of defining uh, pressure of gases. Um, the fourth one is that the time of collisions uh, between the atoms and molecules is negligible compared to the time between the collisions. So in other words, uh, while they're in, in the process, well, oh, keep writing with highlight. So what it's saying here is that the time they spend during the collision is too tiny compared to the time it takes for them to actually collide. Um, this is also a bit untrue for uh, real gases, uh, depending on the volume that the gas is confined to. Uh, but that's why we're making these assumptions. Um, the fifth and last one is the assumption that um, the electrostatic forces between the atoms or molecules is negligible except during collisions. Um, this basically states, and this is a very important part of this topic as well, because we're dealing with ideal gases, so you should know uh, the internal energy of ideal gases. We already saw that internal energy is equal to the kinetic energy plus the potential energy of a substance. So in this case, it's actually telling us that there is no, there are no electrostatic forces, hence there is no potential energy in ideal gases. So the only thing that the internal energy of an ideal gas relies on is the kinetic energy of the, um, well, the sum of random kinetic energies of the atoms in the um, ideal gas. Um, just wanted to mention here again, actually, that um, real gases, this doesn't apply to real gases. There will be tiny um, electrostatic forces between the atoms and molecules in a gas. Um, it wouldn't matter if, for example, I picked uh, this particle here, atom or molecule, because it will experience um, attraction in all directions from the other molecules, in a real gas, not in an ideal gas. And uh, hence, they kind of cancel out. But if that particle is about to hit the um, wall of the container, there wouldn't be any other particles around it in, in that corner. They will be here. So there will be an overall pull on this side, on each side, and not on the wall side. So that would kind of uh, make the measured pressure less than you it would be if it was an ideal gas. So I did talk about the assumptions of ideal gases, but also remember that real gases do have some differences uh, as well from it. Okay, so um, just to explain a little bit about, uh, just to talk about how the gas can actually cause pressure, um, it's quite simple. If you have a container, and within that container you have gas molecules, or atoms, or whatever it is, ions, then those gas um, particles will be moving around and they will collide with the container wall. Now, when the molecules collide with the wall of the container, the container will exert a force on them. And I'm just focusing on one of them right now. So let's say this uh, uh, molecule here 
is moving with a velocity u. Uh, since the collision is um, with the wall is elastic, that means the kinetic energy remains the same, uh, which means the speed remains the same because the mass of the particle is the same. So kinetic energy is a half mv squared. So that means that if the kinetic energy remains the same during the collision, then u um, will be the same. However, it's the speed only that remains the same, not the velocity. The velocity changes, so obviously the, you will expect the particle to come back. So then when it, come back, it comes back, it comes with minus u. Even though it's the same value, it's just negative direction because it's moving in the opposite direction. And uh, what we have is momentum, right? So if we look at momentum, the change in momentum will be the final momentum minus the initial momentum. Final momentum is minus u, minus the initial momentum, which is u. So we get, uh, sorry, u m u. Because um, obviously it's, we're talking about momentum and momentum is mass times velocity. So what we have is minus 2mu for the change in momentum. Now if I use uh, Newton's second law, Newton's second law says that the rate of change in momentum is equal to the resultant force. And here we have minus 2mu divided by time. Um, so you can see that um, the force that's uh, exerted by the container is equal to this much. Uh, but then, obviously, we know from Newton's third law that the atom will also exert an equal and opposite force on the wall. Um, so that's when we uh, look at pressure acting on the wall. We will prove, um, we also need to be able to prove the equation later on that we're going to figure out um, how to calculate the pressure of an ideal gas. But this basically brings us to how an actual gas applies pressure.